And that from a child. You have known the Holy Scriptures. Which are able to make you wise for salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The Churches of Christ. The Bible People. So last Sunday we devoted our time to... Uh, exploring some verses from the Sermon on the Mount that have implications for the topic of forgiveness. And so uh, the ideas that we discussed, I thought I would be able to cover it all in one, one message. And so the things we discussed last week, they're in your lesson notes again today. Uh, if you missed last week's message, it's on our YouTube channel. If you've not subscribed to that, please do so. But you can go back and get caught up on your time. But we're going to dive in, uh, well, and the other thing I want to say as we begin today is I want to say thank you to all of you who took time to engage in the conversation this week. If you get our texts or our emails, you know, I sent out a message asking, you know, let's have some feedback. Why is it so difficult to forgive? And you all were really good to respond in that, and it was across ages from uh, junior high age all the way to the age of some who are in the sunshiners, uh, there were responses. And so I, I thank you for that. That went on throughout the week last week. It's good to be thinking about something so important more than just during this time when we're in here. It needs to be something that continues to be on our mind because God placed great importance on it. And so um, the, we just want to dive right in. Why is it that we struggle so much to forgive. And so the first thing we want to talk about this morning as we dive into that is simply this. The pain we experience is real. If there's one thing that recurred over and over in your responses to me, it's the reality, the simple reality, that when people sin against us, when they hurt us in some way, the pain that they inflict is real, and often that pain lingers. And if we can go on to the next slide. In addition, uh, the pain we're left to deal with uh, sometimes is most prevalent for a couple of reasons. The, the pain doesn't seem to be at its worst with... Uh, maybe somebody we don't know at all or a casual acquaintance, the pain seems to be lingering when the situation involves either someone we love or someone who we thought loved us. The wound seems to always be deeper when we have a relationship with someone, be it a close friend or a family member. And, and often uh, what your response has revealed, it's often not a one-time hurt. Sometimes the people we love, they engage in the same hurtful behaviors over and over again. Several of you pointed that out, because, and it's, you know, it's what you've lived through in the past, or in some cases, maybe what you're living through now. And when those who hurt us are selfish, and, and sometimes even when they've got just a smattering of Bible knowledge, they may even arrogantly demand that we forgive them. And we all understand that pride and arrogance, those are the complete opposites of what, 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 what God wants from us when we realize we've sinned and we realize we've done wrong and we realize we need to be restored. And so in many cases, we will forgive because that's what you do when it's family, right? We'll forgive even when remorse isn't there. But then over time, as those things continue to pile up and those same things happen over and over, we, we become a little bit more reluctant to be as forgiving. In fact, it can feel like we're being lied to by that person, and none of us like to be lied to. No one appreciates that. And so then we end up in a place where we may be truly conflicted because... We know what the parable talks about in Matthew chapter 18, the one that we're going to look more closely at next week, Lord willing, but we're, we're going to notice where the teaching there is, as often as is necessary, we are called to forgive the person who sins against us. And so that pain and that conflicted feeling, often it's going to linger. The second recurring response that you gave, it relates to the difficulty uh, associated with forgiving someone who hurts the people we love. 
We may not know them well. We may not even be close to this person. But if that person has somehow sinned against or hurt those we are close to, it can be really difficult to forgive. It can feel like that person has committed that offense, not against them, but against us. Could be our children. Could be our spouse. Or really any family member, any loved one, any person that we're close to. And so the pain, then it's real And often the struggle to forgive is no joke. And I wanted to begin there and acknowledge all of that because without doing so, it might not allow our ears to be as open to some of the other things that we want to talk about today because sometimes there will be times where I have trouble forgiving and it it may relate to some shortcomings on my part. And so we want to think about a couple of those as we study for the next few minutes this morning. Another reason that it sometimes is difficult for us to forgive is that maybe I experience a sense of either revenge or comfort in somehow passing judgment on the person who has sinned against me. Withholding my forgiveness, it may provide me with this sense of getting even. I'm holding something over the other person's head that they want and now they can't have it. Maybe it's a power play on my part of sorts. Or it may just make me feel good to not give them what they want. They want to be forgiven. I refuse to forgive them in return. And maybe somehow that feels good to me. A bit of that eye for an eye mentality that Jesus actually teaches against in the Sermon on the Mount. I've somehow decided that I know exactly what they were thinking and exactly what they were intending when they hurt me. I've got my foot on them and I'm simply not going to let them up because after all, if I keep them down, maybe it prevents them from hurting someone else. One of the other reasons I won't forgive, I've judged them to not be worthy of forgiveness. I want to notice Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 again from the Sermon on the Mount and in that those verses Jesus says this these are familiar words do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Now We probably don't spend as much time on this passage as we should because it tends to be one of the most misunderstood and misapplied passages of the Bible in our New Testaments. One of the concepts to understand, this passage has to do with the kinds of assumptions we make about people and their motives. Do I... Do I most often tend to assume good motives or bad motives in people? Do I tend to think about the, do I tend to think the best about people until they prove otherwise? Uh, or do I tend to assume the worst about people and then force them to prove me wrong? See, it's worth doing some self-examination on this. How do we approach folks? What is our kind of mindset toward the way we do relationships? Because life has a way of jading us toward people. Because the hurts of life, often they will mount up on us and they'll just cause us to, anytime there's any doubt, we just start assuming the worst about people and their intentions and their motives and everything about them. Sometimes we may even slip into the trap of giving strangers more benefit of the doubt than we do to our own friends and loved ones. Why? Well, because we've decided our friends and loved ones, we know them so well. We know what makes them tick. We know if they really cared, they never would have hurt us. Yet, as we said before, God did this amazing work in creating us, but God did not create us with the ability to know what's in another person's mind. He didn't make us that way. He didn't make us so that we know what's in that other person's heart, even the people that we're close to. So there's an important reminder also from Jesus in this teaching. We will be treated in the same way we treat other people in regard to the kinds of assumptions that we tend to make about them. If I'm highly negative and highly judgmental and I tend to think the worst about everybody, guess what? That's how people are going to treat me. However, what this passage does not do, 
because there's plenty of other Bible, and we don't have time to dive in this morning, but what this passage doesn't do when Jesus says, do not judge, it does not nullify, it does not negate our responsibility to hold each other accountable for the way we live as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you see me falling into sin, your job is to call me out on it. And when you see that and you call me out, that is not judging me, holding each other accountable. It's what we've been called to do. There's a difference. We need to understand it. Now, let's talk about a couple of ways that we sometimes fall into the trap of sitting in judgment over others. Maybe we are guilty of making a decision about whether someone has been sincere in asking us for forgiveness. Now, they come to us, and I decide they're just not serious about that. Happens with people we know well, and sometimes happens with people we don't know well at all. We may think or say things like, well, if he was serious about our relationship, he wouldn't have hurt me again. Or, he would, you know, if he was serious, he wouldn't have done that in the first place. Sometimes it comes to light that maybe a brother or sister has been living in sin and when they, uh, when they respond publicly and they begin asking, they're actually what they're asking for is the Lord's forgiveness, but the sin's public, that it's known, so they're asking publicly. We may tend to think, or sometimes we even say it out loud, well, they just responded, they just asked for forgiveness because they got caught. Are you sure about that? Or the person that has hurt us, they've come to us and they've tried to explain uh, what was going on with them as, they, as they're seeking our forgiveness and we'll say something like, well, that's not what you were thinking or that's not what you intended to do. We're essentially calling the person who's seeking forgiveness a liar. When did we become mind readers? Yes, sometimes the, the offense seems to repeat itself. It happens. We've been hurt by repeated offenses. That's why we talked about boundaries last week. Boundaries may need to be put in place to prevent that person from being able to hurt you in the same way over and over again. But the thing is, sometimes we may be too quick to make assumption about the motives of people, both those we know well and those we barely know at all. Even when we're close to people and we think we know them extremely well, there may be something going on in that person's life of which we're not fully aware. Sinful patterns can be extremely difficult to break, especially if a person happens not to be as focused on his or her walk with God as maybe they ought to be. But when we get too casual about making decisions about a person's sincerity, we can very quickly find ourselves in the wrong, passing judgment, if you will, even though we may be exactly right. When, we're, uh, when we think that thought about them, about maybe they weren't serious or maybe the wrong things were in their mind, what we're thinking might actually be true. They might be doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. It's possible that they only repented because their sin became public. But here's the thing. God alone knows the heart. God is going to get it right. No one's ever pulled one over on God. We don't know the heart. We can't know the heart. We were not created that way. He simply has instructed us to forgive when we're asked to forgive. And if someone pulls one over on us, God will deal with that. Because God always gets it right. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. He is the one to whom that person who sins against me is accountable. God will deal with that in his time. And so if I forgive someone who hasn't been sincere in asking, I've done the right thing. In other words, if I'm going to err, I'd better err on the side of being gracious and being generous in my judgment. And no matter how badly or, or I or anyone else has been deceived, God will get it right in the end. And see, if I can keep that in my mind, it should be a little easier to forgive. Finally, we can be guilty of passing judgment on others 
when we decide that a person just doesn't deserve our forgiveness. Uh, this one came out in your feedback, uh, perhaps due to the severity of the offense. Maybe you've heard a, person, a person's been hurt and they'll say something like, well, they just don't understand how deeply they've hurt me. I I'll never be able to forgive them. And never is one of those words. I, you probably ought to just kick it out of your vocabulary. Use it very, very rarely. We asked the question last week, do we forgive people because they deserve it? No. Did we deserve it when God forgave us? No. Our job is to forgive when the person who they seek that from us. Our job is to forgive them. If boundaries are needed, we put those in place to protect ourselves from future hurt. But let's not talk ourselves into believing that we have to do God's job for him. He can do the job that he has said he'll do. The third reason that maybe it sometimes is difficult for us to forgive is sometimes we fall into this trap of having an overinflated view. I have an overinflated view of me. And obviously, none of us like to be hurt. None of us like to be used or to know that we've been taken advantage of in some way. And obviously, no one looks forward to being sinned against. And especially on a recurring basis, but in the end, if I think too highly of myself and it prevents me from forgiving someone, I'm in the wrong. This might manifest itself. Sometimes you may hear somebody say something like, well, they just don't know who they've messed with. You ever heard that one? Or they must not know who I am. You ever heard that one? That is pride, that is arrogance, that is a person who's going to have a really, really hard time forgiving anyone. It might also eventually manifest itself in what I would simply call fake forgiveness. We say we forgive, but we take that offense and we just tuck it away right here under the edge of the table so the next time that person makes a mistake, we just pull that right back out. We throw it on the table. We throw it in their face. We've never forgiven them in the first place if we're doing that. And again, often it relates to, to a problem with thinking too much of ourselves. Because if we say we've forgiven someone, if I tell you I've forgiven you, but I haven't really done that, I'm now not just a person who's withholding a forgiveness, I'm also a liar, okay? Pride can get in a way, in the way, and, and, and that's another point that you all included in your feedback. My own pride and my own arrogance can make it very difficult for me to forgive, one of the problems with an overinflated view of self is that it contributes to an unwillingness to put ourselves out there, to expose ourselves to the idea that we might be hurt again. Now, last week we discussed the idea that forgiveness with full reconciliation, that is the ultimate level, that's the ideal level. If that's at all possible, that's what we ought to shoot for. Why? It's worth shooting for because that's the way God forgives us. He restores the relationship back to where it was as if our offense against him had never, ever happened. However, we all understand that forgiveness with full reconciliation is risky. You might wreck my truck again. That's our illustration from last week. Or you might just wreck my bank account or my important relationships or my overall well-being. When we forgive with full reconciliation, we are opening the door for someone to hurt us again. We may as well acknowledge it because that's what forgiving with full reconciliation entails. And that's why it's not always possible. I realize it's likely not news to any of us that... God doesn't want us thinking too highly of ourselves. He doesn't want that to be a part of the problem. The Bible weighs in on this. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. In context, the teaching there is I don't need to get all uppity about myself because of some gift God has blessed me with because I'm still a part of the body of Christ. But the idea here is about not being focused on self. And Paul's going to actually say here, I'm giving you a warning. Romans 12, verse 3. 
because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, some of the same ideas, same thought we read a, that was read a minute ago by Noah. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And from there, Paul just goes on to detail the way Christ humbled himself by obediently living heaven, leaving the presence of God, coming here, living on this earth so that we could murder him. As difficult as it may be to genuinely forgive, it's never in our best interest to allow our own pride to be a contributing factor. One other thing related to this over-inflated view of self that can sometimes trip us up, remember this, not everything that offends us is a sin against us. Not everything that offends us is a sin against us. Some of the offenses that we latch on to were never intended for us in the first place. It may be a sin against God. It may be a sin against someone else, but it wasn't a sin against us. In other words, there are times we need to learn to kind of let things bounce off of us and not let them affect us in a way that causes us to not be Jesus-like in our response. The better we become at being less offended... Sometimes we call it wearing our feelings on our sleeve. The better we'll be at re helping restore the person who needs to be restored, who's fallen in sin, whatever it may be that's going on in their life. And that kind of leads us to the other one we want to mention before we finish up. Sometimes it's difficult to forgive because I simply do not love people as I should. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us, so we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. From 1 John chapter 4, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Sometimes it's difficult to forgive. And especially within the content, context of a church family, because I haven't made the decision to truly love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember always, the kind of love we're called to in Christ, it's not just an emotional feeling. The kind of love we're called to, it's a decision we make regarding how we'll treat people, how we'll interact with them, how we'll care about them, how we'll pray for them. That's why it's possible to love someone that you don't necessarily like. Because we've all been there. We know how that works. But see, the thing is, when I don't love the way I should, I may struggle to forgive the way I should. Think about it. How can I hold a grudge when I truly love someone? And aren't you thankful that God doesn't hold a grudge against us? Because when we humbly go before God and we seek His forgiveness, God never crosses His arms... God never takes a step back and says, I don't know. What you've done this time, it's been a really bad sin. I just don't know. It's going to take a while. I may never get over this one. God doesn't do us that way. God treats us so much better than we sometimes treat each other. And again, the hurt's real and we're human and sometimes we don't get it right. But, but if we love people, it ought to help us be more forgiving. In the end, it will bless us to always remember who receives the blessing when we choose to forgive. Now, we emphasized this last week, and I mentioned that it would be a point of emphasis in all three of the messages that we're going to consider on forgiveness. You may already be familiar with Corey Ten Boom. She and her family, they worked to help many Jewish people escape from the Nazis during the Holocaust in World War II by hiding them in their home. 
Uh, Corey and her family, they were eventually caught. She was arrested, sent to a German concentration camp. She narrowly escaped the gas chamber herself. And if you take time to dive into her story, it is fascinating. And if you attempt to somehow put yourself in her shoes, in the shoes of someone who saw all the things she saw, experienced all the things she experienced, it's, it's no small wonder that, that her life wasn't jaded forever and filled with hate for a group of people who destroyed so many lives. And yet she was this person of faith who understood something powerful about forgiveness. And I know you all talked about this a little bit in the, uh, the adult class in the back last week. But this is what she said. She said to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover the prisoner was you. And sometimes we keep ourselves imprisoned. We keep ourselves in negativity. We keep ourselves thinking all of these horrible things about people. And if we'll just forgive, it is the most important thing that we can do to start the process of, of healing. And, and, and really, when you think about what forgiving is, it's also a process. It's a decision we make, but it's also a process. Forgiveness, it begins with a decision, much like that decision when I make the decision, I'm going to love somebody, I'm going to love this person, we make a decision about the, how we're going to treat the person that we are offering forgiveness to. No longer holding the, I'm not going to hold the previous offense against them any longer. Yes, there may be a new boundary in place. The relationship may look a little different than it did before. The long-term goal out there might still be full reconciliation at some point. We ought to at least be open to that. But just because I've made the decision to forgive, you know this, you understand this, it doesn't mean I'm not still going to struggle with my feelings for that person at, at times because along the way I may have to remind myself frequently that I have forgiven this person. Why? And you all brought this up. Sometimes just seeing that person can bring this flood of negativity over us, this, this flood of negative emotion, because it reminds us, because we never truly forget. But if we'll make the decision and we'll stick with the process over time as we continue to treat that person according to the decision that we've made, hopefully those negative emotions, they, they lessen, and maybe in time there will be a day when they just no longer exist at all. In the meantime, there are a couple of proactive things we can do. A couple of suggestions I'll offer. Lift up the person who has wronged you in prayer. Pray for them. It's really hard to be thinking negative, hurtful, all those garbage sorts of thoughts when we're actually praying for the person. Pray, that that, pray for that person's spiritual well-being. You might also be able to look for an opportunity to be Jesus to that person in some way. Maybe doing something good for them, ministering to that person in some positive way. Positive Christian living is another powerful way to promote healing and to enforce the idea that, yes, I'm, I'm in the process of forgiving this person. Thomas is going to lead us in the song of invitation today. And I would simply say, if you're still in prison by sin today, God is ready to forgive you. He's ready to free you. If you've not been baptized into Christ, don't let today's opportunity pass you by. Uh, we mentioned Rich and Wendy, Wendy on Wednesday evening when we were here, and I said, you know, maybe we ought to just start asking who's next. Who's the next person who's ready to be freed from their sin? If that's what you need today, let me encourage you to take advantage of today's opportunity. Maybe there's something else going on in your life and you need to make a new start and you'd like our shepherds to pray with you and for you. If that's your need today, you can let that be known. Whatever your need may be, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing. Hello? This is he. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll be right there. I'm here to pick up Alden Call. Did you fill this form out? We'll notify you of a court date within 30 days. Dad, 
I know I messed up and I'm sorry. Come on, bud. Let's get you home. <laughs>